Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Gleb Sapursky, I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today with me is Anthony. Anthony, can you tell us a little bit about what you, yourself and what you do? Yeah, um, I'm the executive director of the Future of Life Institute. I'm also a professor of physics at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, so I've had a, a long interest in kind of mm -hmm. the big picture questions and, and AI is now one of the biggest picture questions that there is that, that we're facing as a society. It is. And we, the Future of Life Institute led the open letter about six months ago or so by now that called for a pause on AI. And a lot of prominent business leaders, including Elon Musk and plenty of others, have signed that letter. So why do you think business leaders signed the letter? I mean, clearly AI is quite beneficial for productivity, for profits, for bottom lines. So why did they sign the letter? What is uh, the concern that they should have about it? Mm -hmm. Well, from what I hear, business leaders are, are people too. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. their own sort of future in existence. Um, and I think it, it's important to note that the, the targets of this letter are the very sort of cutting edge, new giant AI experiments that are being run in a handful of companies. This is not a letter about, you know, limiting AI in general or that AI is bad or it's not useful and so on. There, there are lots of risks for the sorts of AI that we have now, but there are also yeah. lots of benefits from those. And one of the yeah. things that we're going to have to work out as a society are kind of how to get most of those benefits and avoid those risks. Um, but there's a new level of risk when we go into these giant new AI systems that are going to have capabilities that we simply can't predict and don't know whether we're going to mm -hmm. be able to control. And so I think the, the sort of huge response to the letter goes to the feeling that uh, you know, people, including business leaders, including mm -hmm. policymakers, the general public, feel like we're on this kind of out of control freight train that's just rushing forward mm -hmm. in AI capability without taking a moment to consider, you know, are these systems safe? How are we going to keep them under control? How are we going to make sure that they're beneficial to us? How mm -hmm. are we going to work them into our lives in a way that promotes well-being? Um, and so I think there's that sense. And I think that yeah. was what was behind the, the response to the letter. So business leaders, of course, are typically pro-technology. We've had a lot of technology whose consequences we don't know. And clearly, AI has already shown quite high productivity benefits. The generative AI, all of these, chat GPT and Claude and so on. And major companies are invested, very invested into it. I mean, Amazon recently invested a lot of money into Anthropic, which runs Claude. And of course, earlier, Microsoft invested a lot of money into OpenAI. Google bought DeepMind. These are the probably the three most important labs the gen creating the new versions of generative AI, which are quite potentially problematic. So we have these large investments. We have this large productivity. Why should business leaders think that this is something inherently different than other forms of technology whose future consequences we didn't know? Yeah, I think it, it's always difficult to know where the technology is going to go in terms of its utility. Mm -hmm sort of how it's going to advance. Um, what's different about these gen these new AI systems is that we we literally don't know what they're going to be able to do and we don't know how to do it, right? We, we're used to building technologies where we design the technology, we understand how it's supposed to work, we engineer it to do a certain thing and then it does that thing or it fails and then we fix it. Um, these AI systems, I mean, AI in general is a technology, especially in its more modern sort of neural network incarnation, where we design the goal of the system, uh, roughly speaking, and the system figures out how to achieve that goal. Yeah. Um, but now we don't even quite do that. We design a sort of proxy goal, like complete the sentence, mm. uh, you know, put all of the human, all of the human internet and, you know, all of the fruits of 100 billion transistor chips, you know, tens of thousands of them for, for months. Uh, and we get this model that does translation and uh, writes poetry and does code and all of these things from this simple metric of complete the sentence. So we don't even give them their goals anymore exactly. We, we sort of grow this digital system and then we figure out that it can do all these useful, potentially useful things and all these potentially risky things. And we, we sort of try to uh, 
shake our finger at it and 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 hit it with a stick when it does the things we don't want it to do and we give it a little praise when it does the things we do we want it to do so it's a very very different sort of system from a normal piece of technology where we have a use in mind we design the thing it does exactly how it was designed or else we fix it you know these are more akin to bringing into you know new biological beings that we have to like mm. train and and like domesticate or something mm. and you know if you think about bringing in some biological being into your house, mm -hmm. you want to be something, you know what it's going to do and, and you feel mm -hmm. some, trust. you don't want to bring some giant, scary, wild animal that you don't know what it's going to do into your house. And I think that's sort of what we're doing with these new AI systems. We mm -hmm. don't want to, you know, it's, it's not that you can't make use of a giant, like powerful animal, but you don't just want mm -hmm. to bring it into your house willy nilly without knowing what it's going to do, or can you predict it or can you control it? Mm -hmm. So let's think about what might happen. So Google might is probably going to come out with Gemini soon, and you know, there's going to be a Chat GPT five or four point five or five. Let's say there's a Chat GPT six version, and the company and it does a lot more advanced stuff, but it's still the same idea, complete sentence. So let's say a company takes that and says, "Hey, Chat GPT six, the enterprise version for our company. Why don't we give you the goal of?" just raising our bottom line. What would be some potential problems that a company can find itself, can, can result in if it gives it that very clear goal, which is the goal of companies, business leaders? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so first I think it's important to note that you know we don't know what chat GPT 5 or 6 or, or anything else is going to be able to do. I mean, if you, if you take, um, if you look at, you know, 10 times as much training or 10 times as many neurons in a biological system, that's a very big different system that, you know, that's the difference between a, a three-year-old and a 30-year-old or, or between a bear and a person. So we, we really don't know like how advanced these, this next generation, but let's just say for argument's sake that it's just better. It's very similar system, just like better at what it does. Yeah. Um, now, suppose we're, you know, I'm a business, I give it my, the goal of making my bottom line better, you know, making more profit, making my products better and so on. So what's it going to do? It's going to start giving me lots of good advice. Um, and I'll start taking that advice. And if the system is effective, if it's really good, uh, that advice will pay off and I'll mm -hmm. take more advice. I'll delegate more decisions to that AI system. Um, so pretty soon the AI system is going to be making a lot of my business decisions and, mm -hmm. and it's great. feels good. It's making me a lot of money. Yeah. Meanwhile, my competitors are also using their the same mm -hmm. AI system or maybe their own to do their business decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm a business that decides to make human decisions and not use the AI, um, I may find myself you know, at a competitive disadvantage because all mm -hmm. my competitors, yeah. maybe they're making better decisions. Maybe it's just faster. Maybe I just feel like I have to use AI, but I'm going to feel like I have to AI, use AI mm -hmm. too. So pretty soon we have a whole bunch of businesses whose decisions are being made by AI systems, maybe even the mm -hmm. same one you know, that's all run by OpenAI or all run by Google or whatever just, you know, helping all these different businesses compete with each other. Um, now GPT-7 comes along, more decisions get put, put onto the AI system. At some point we have to ask who's actually running these businesses, hmm. um, who's actually competing with who. It's, it's gonna look like AI systems running the businesses and AI systems competing with each other, even mm -hmm. though they all work for the same company. So I think that's where we're, that's where we're most likely headed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is a risky future for humanity if okay. the most, if the biggest decisions made by the, you know, some of the most powerful entities on the planet, our, our businesses, are basically all being made by AI systems mm -hmm. that we don't understand. And we, you know, we may control them in the sense that we can tell them, we give them the goal, we tell mm -hmm. them what to do in that sense, if they're like ChatGPT, but we're not going to be in charge if all we're doing is following their instructions. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of, uh, risk that I see for society as we go down this road. Now, for a, for an individual business, I think the risk yeah. you have is of the AI not doing, you know, giving bad advice and not not you know not doing really what it's supposed to, uh, not really understanding mm -hmm. the nuance of the world that it's in. Um, all of the things that are humans are still better at. It, uh, mm -hmm. It's going to be mixed up in the things that the AI is not good at. You know, currently they still hallucinate a lot. They confidently sure. assert things that are not true. They do all of these things. Presumably those will get better. But I think um, unless we have a sort of 
pretty significant upgrade in architecture, those they, those sort of weaknesses are still going to be there because they're not mm -hmm. understanding the world in the same way that humans are. I think those might be remediable, but it, you know, we were talking about extrapolating today's systems. Yeah, which is one reasonable. I mean, certainly something can be different, but thinking about extrapolating today's systems. Well, the open letter, there's, there's certainly concerns about AI not simply running everything, but having some existential risks, meaning something that might actually cause the destruction of humanity. How do you go from that AI making decisions that chat GPT-7, whatever version, making decisions to actually existential risks for humanity? Yeah, well, I think it's you know, existential risk is a, is a slightly tricky word because people mean mm -hmm. different things by it. I think there, there are a few different things people sometimes mean. One is really catastrophic risk, like mm -hmm. large scale catastrophe or, <clears throat> excuse me, danger to humanity. Mm -hmm. There, I think the the primary danger is really sort of bad actors um, mm -hmm. that leverage the power of these systems to do things that they wouldn't have been able to do before. So mm -hmm. I think um, empowering huge numbers of people really is great in general, um, but there are downsides to empowering everybody if some mm -hmm. of the things that you empower them to do are destructive because it's generally much easier to destroy things than to build yeah. them. So if you empower everybody to destroy or to build, you're going to get a lot of destruction, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I think that's one one danger where we, you know, we've seen that AI systems already have the capability to build new poisons, you know, design new mm -hmm. poisons. Uh, we heard from the, the CEO of Anthropic that in a couple of years, AI systems may well be able to sort of engineer new bioweapons or, or new mm -hmm. pathogens um, if they're not properly controlled. So there's just a, there are a lot of things that are very scary for the world that it, up until now has taken human experts to do. And it's not mm -hmm. so easy, you know, human experts are not so easy to get to do, you know, in groups, high paid, like terribly immoral and destructive things. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, it happens, it happens, sure. but, but it's not so easy to do. Um, whereas if you just have to tell your AI, please build me a chemical weapon and it just does, um, then that's going to be pretty easy. So I think that's one class of risks. Okay. A second one is really the extinction risk. And I mm -hmm. think that falls into two categories. One is sort of what we talked about before, that as these systems get more and more powerful, we just mm -hmm. delegate more and more control and more and more decisions to them. At some point down the road, we find that basically humanity just doesn't have much control at all over what the world is doing. Mm -hmm. It already feels like that now sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> do, we, do we really control our economy? Um, do we really control our political system? Like, but the, And yet there's no AI around. But, but imagine now that all of those things are being mediated by these giant systems that we don't really understand how they work, <laughs> really understand fundamentally what's going on inside them, um, really don't understand their goals. And, <laughs> and it's all happening at way faster than human speed. I think we're going to feel like we don't really have control of the world, and, we, and indeed we won't. Um, and so that, I think, once we lose control of the world to this sort of amalgamation of AI systems, mm -hmm. that could go fine, or it could go, exis you know, existentially bad. It won't mm -hmm. be up to us. You know, that that's just going to be up to the AI systems, and we're going to mm -hmm. have to hope um, that, that we're compatible with the goals that they end up having. Um, so that's the second one. A third... Mm -hmm is the more classic accident you know that that the people who were doing these giant ai experiments find that they kind of overreach that the that the system that they develop is just much more capable than they thought it was going to be that they mm -hmm. don't really know how to control that system that the system um starts proliferating you know outside of the outside of the lab or it starts self improving in a way that they don't understand that it's deceiving them these kind of they feel like science fiction y things, but but mm -hmm. that's you know, we're living in a science fiction world at this point, mm -hmm. uh, the level of AI systems that we have. So I think it's it's more of a the rogue AI scenario where the AI has mm -hmm. its own uh has its own aims or 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 a good aim that is incompatible with our existence and we're unable to stop it, even though we mm -hmm. know that we're doing uh things that we don't like. So I think that's to me, that's one of the smaller probabilities, uh, but I think it's not out of the realm of possibility. And that's something that we have to be like very careful of because that's our extinction. Um, and then the fourth I think is is existential in kind of the like existential literature sense, like, like what's it all about? 
right? And I, and I think AI really is a risk in that sense. Oh, like if you, if you ask, you know, what is the purpose of, of human life? Like, what are we here for? Um, the things that give our life meaning, a lot of them, if we just turn those over to AI systems, I think that's a that's a huge risk to our humanity. If our mm -hmm. if all our culture is not coming out of humans, but out of generative AI models, um, if our decisions are coming out of AI systems, if our social structures are designed by AI and we just sort of mm -hmm. like play along, where is our humanity? So, so I think that that is actually a, a risk that that is one of the one of the more high probability ones, along with mm -hmm. the sort of delegation of control away from us. Um, so those are the ways that I would I think of existential risk. Okay, that's very helpful. I haven't thought about that, that last one. That's really interesting. Now, when I think about the risks number two and three, kind of the rogue AI or AI lack of control, that seems to me like it happens in a scenario where there's no central agent or agents that can, that can slow down or control AI. So it's I think of it as a difference between, let's say, AI being developed by Microsoft and OpenAI or Google and DeepMind or Amazon and Tropic, kind of closed private systems versus, let's say, what Meta is doing and releasing open source models, where open source models are much harder to control because there's no you know, open AI can't go and shut down the open source model and Meta can't shut down its open source model. So do you see a bigger threat than from the open source movement, what are your thoughts on specifically where the kind of threat for the delegation of control without being able to turn it off or the rogue AI without it being able to turn it off? Where is it coming from? Yeah, I think, you know, open open source is a tricky term with, with AI models because it's it's not actually the source code that that is really the interesting the thing. It's the, it's the weights in the AI model. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you know, the source code is kind of interesting if you happen to have, you know, 10,000 high powered GPUs at your disposal, but otherwise it's it's the weights. Um, and the what's problematic about open sourcing uh, AI models, especially ones that have been sort of, ha that have had guardrails put on them so that they don't do some of the more dangerous things is that once they're open sourced, you can simply take those guardrails off and do all of those dangerous things if you choose to. So, so class, sort of open source software in in the pre AI era, like open source cryptography software, for example, mm -hmm. it just gets better as you open if you open source it. You know, everybody takes a look at it. They see it's got oh uh oh it's got this weakness. The company that made it or the person that made it fixes that weakness. Nobody wants to use the old one because who wants worse cryptography? You always sure. want better cryptography. Um, and so there's a sense in which open sourcing that improves the software and makes it better you know, and safer, right? It's un bad cryptography is unsafe cryptography. With, with open source uh, AI models, they, they also you know, tend toward doing what people want them to do in the sense that they remove all the safety restrictions. Mm -hmm. But there you're then back to the question of uh, by empowering all these people with a model that will do anything they want, mm -hmm. what is the sort of risk versus safety balance yeah. in doing so. And that's a difficult question. You know, I'm I'm a big believer in sort of empowering lots of people. I you know, mm -hmm. I I don't like the idea of giant companies having all the power in themselves. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of sort of it more spread out. Um, but at the same time, there are things that are too risky to open source. We don't tell everybody exactly how to make nuclear weapons or you know, bioweapons or the worst sorts of, of chemical agents. And um and I, I think this is going to be a, a problem that we really have to face. Um, mm. what, I, what I don't think we can do is pretend that we can have both safety you know, and, and mitigating the risk and open source. I just think those yeah. are sort of compatible with each other. We have to bite the bullet and say, we're going to proliferate this risk. Um, or we have to say, we're not going to open source things. I'm not sure we get to have it both ways, unfortunately. Yeah, that's what it seems to me that that's kind of a pretty risky scenario. Well. So business leaders, one thing they can clearly do is not support the open source movement if they don't want that to happen. What else can they actually do practically and pragmatically if they want to address the kind of risks that you're raising, which are serious risks? 
Yeah, I, I think um, staying involved is one thing, you know, in the sense mm -hmm. that we had a lot of support from business leaders with the original open letter. I think mm -hmm. uh, these are people that carry a lot of weight in society, both, you know, economic weight and and reputational weight and networks and, and so on. So their, their opinion matters. And I think uh, making that opinion clear that we have to, you know, care about the, the safety of these systems is important. I think also the idea that um, that making these AI systems safer means that they're going to be sort of less profitable or that they're going to be that they're that it's sort of anti-innovation um, I, I think is quite problematic in mm -hmm. in the sense that I think you know it's hard to innovate in products that are like inherently dangerous or unsafe mm -hmm. this is this is just not a great business model um, so I think I think AI is, going to get regulated one way or another mm -hmm. and in various different levels. I think, you know, regulation is coming in the EU for some, in yeah. some ways, I think legislation is probably going to come eventually in the U S um, though it may, it may be, it may be slower because I, slow. I, the, you know, there are too many risks. There are going to be accidents. There are going to be negative consequences and there's going to be calls for regulation. Um, so I think the question is whether that regulation is going to be uh sort of well done or poorly done. Mm. Uh, and, and I would, insofar as AI companies uh, or industry in general is engaged mm. in the sort of policy space and the regulatory mm. space, I would just urge them to, to sort of consider um, not just the, the sort of niche issue that they might have in their own favor. You know, we all know how, what happens behind closed doors and regulation making and in lawmaking uh, in various jurisdictions. And I think we all really sort of, you know, it's a little bit idealistic, but I would hope that even even lobbyists are people too, um, <laughs> not business leaders, but lobbyists are, are people too. Um, we all are, and and to keep in mind that um, this is a real danger, and that we have to like figure out how, as a, you know, not just as a sort of society or a country, but even as a species, we're going to have to worry about how to mitigate this risk to everybody. Yeah. And so just a little bit of sort of putting aside private vested interest and keeping the the interest of humanity at the forefront um, would be great. This is something that that's uh, sort of easy for me to do because I work for an organization that just has humanity's interest as its goal. This is a lot harder to do, I understand, when you're in a yeah. business and you've got a particular you know, business interests that you have to uphold. Um, so it's easy for me to say, but it but it also is, I think, just very important. We're all we're all people. That's a wonderful message to end with. If people want to learn more about what the Future of Life Institute is doing on AI, where should they go? Uh, our website is really the best place. It's got it's got mm -hmm. lots of resources and and what we're up to. Excellent. That's futureoflife.org. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anthony. You really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was great to chat. And thank you to the audience for checking out another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe to our reach without the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show. All right, everyone. I'll see you in the next episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. And in the meantime, the wisest and most profitable decisions to you, my friends.